All right, let's see how this comes together. Um, Ronnie had some good ideas as usual. Uh, last Sunday, she actually wrote some notes on the board, but you guys are becoming cleaner here and cleaning stuff faster. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to recreate this. So this was stuff that was on here from last week. Um, and we were talking about joy last week. And without kind of going into a big summary, uh, what I want to highlight is uh, I said that I'm going to emphasize every time I talk from now on is this idea of, hey, what is the gospel and why? And basically, why God? Why God in the midst of anything that we talk about? And, and when I say why God, you know, that, that kind of demands to highlight the gospel. And when I say the gospel, I want to continue to emphasize what the gospel mean. Good news. Again, I... I I don't know why I feel the need to emphasize that, except that um, for those of us that have grown up in a Christian environment or been in a, in a Christian church church land for that long, for very long, um, it just seems like words, we use words without really trying to think about what, what they mean. And gospel seems to be one of those words that we use the word gospel <clears throat> Um, and it just has a meaning, which can be good, but I, I want to just highlight this idea that the gospel means good news. So what is the good news? And, and good news isn't just some religious theological thing. Uh, again, you know, I, I talked about, uh, used the example a few weeks ago of, you know, a guy talking to me about the solution to the chop chaz thing, the, 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 kind of like that t-shirt that says, y'all need Jesus. But it's just, it's like, what does that mean? I, I want to I constantly say or, or throw out there and for us to talk about, well, what does that mean? We can agree with that. We, we kind of have an idea of what that means. But I mean, from the practical level, not just some magical religious thing, what does that mean? So Because often when we say the word gospel or we, or we use the word Jesus, we're kind of we kind of, I guess, are using it almost in a magical sense. Like you just throw out the word Jesus, or we talk about the gospel for a little bit, and it's just some magical, mystical thing. Whereas more and more, I'm seeing it as entirely practical. And when I say practical, I mean like to every minute of the, the human life and existence. So as usual, we've got man, and I put creatures, because man are creatures. I'm not talking about dogs and things. So um, I'm talking about man being a creature, and being the creature it, uh, means what? What are we always talking about as far as just highlighting the idea that man is a creature? Autonomy. Okay, autonomy. Okay, I'll, I'll write that little. So autonomous, all the time we're using that word. Autonom, whoops, autono. Mus, is that right? That's not right. I'm all in favor, say aye. Right. Period. Autonomy. Oh, shoot, not on me. Doggone it. Just put I did. Autonomous. Autonomous. What other words are helpful with autonomy for you? Ruler. Ruler. King. Ruler. King. King. Little. Uh, Little R. So we're little rulers. We're little kings and queens. We want to we want to be in charge of ourselves, okay? And that's just our incessant desire. So that's just the that's the heart of man. That's the heart of creatures. But also that when I say creatures, I'm thinking of this idea that I'm thinking of a different idea. Not not just autonomy. I mean that's the problem with creatures. But God created us as creatures. What? Yeah. So we're created beings, and what I always highlight it, it, he created us to be in need of him. We say help, we'll use the word help here in a little bit. We're created to be in need of help, but I think it's even better to highlight this idea that we're created to be in need of him. He's the help. It's not just stuff he's helping us with. He's the help. Okay, so um, I don't really know how to just... I guess I'll just go right into it. Ronnie thought about this idea again. This, the ladies have been talking about 
this fundamental concept out of Romans for years now, okay? And it starts with Genesis in chapter 2, where God says, it is not good for man to be alone. Okay, so highlighting the idea of creatures, what did God create creatures to, to what was the dynamic that he created? Need, need him, need, need uh, help. It, 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 it's companionship. It's a, it's a need. He created us to be in that dynamic, that relationship, primarily the relationship with him. <clears throat> and that's a, that's a relationship of help. So God highlights, and well, I'm not going to debate about, you know, the, you know, the concept that uh, I, I want to just highlight the fact that primarily what God was, was talking about when God said, it is not good for man to be alone, even though, you know, after that you see that he created animals to, you know, to be with man and he created his help meet to be with man, his wife, uh, Eve. But ultimately, his ultimate need to be with something or someone is who? Is God. Okay, that's the ultimate, that's, that's, the, that's the need piece, okay? Because what we do see is did the other stuff fulfill, how can I say that? Did animals fulfill man's need? Did animals fulfill man's need? Don't so God said, it is, <laughs> it is not good for a man to be alone. God creates animals. What are you saying about dogs? Dogs get pretty darn close. <laughs> God's, uh, dogs get pretty darn close. However, it does not fulfill man's need as far as the, the dynamic to be in relationship with God, right? Yeah. So, is this about dogs? No. Okay. It's, it's just I had a thought, which is obvious except to me, and like, oh wow. So he could have a, a, a synonym. Trotter's paraphrase: It's not good for man to be autonomous. We planned that. Oh, did you? Yeah. Not we. Just, just roll with me, okay? Well, okay. Yeah, we did. So you guys just hear him? So explain that again. Say it again, Greg. So a trotter paraphrase. God says, it's not good for man to be alone. Which would, could also be said in a paraphrase, it's not good for man to be autonomous. Okay, you guys got that? I mean, any ideas or thoughts or questions about that? He's... he's Equating the alone word with autonomous. What makes you autonomous? Jeff. Well, I was thinking that it's funny because the creature word, when we talk about autonomy, the ruler, the king, I mean, the creature word forces us, forces us to reckon with the fact that it, it's an illusion. Like, we're not really autonomous. We can try to be. But so even that, it's like, we're not really. We're not really alone in the ways we want to be, but we think we can be autonomous. So it's not good for us to be in, in the reality where it's like a lie. It's part of life that we need to do with that idea. As if we are, and we're thinking we're really not. And again, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I, I'm thinking of both the word autonomous and alone with what you're saying. You know, we're thinking we're alone or we're thinking we're autonomous. And we, we're never alone. We're never autonomous. But it, So, yeah, you're right. You know what else? You know what that word means in Genesis when it uses the word alone? What, Ronnie? I thought you were five just oh, ahead of me as that. usual. I was going to give a definition of autonomous. Okay, go ahead. Like a, like a Webster's English one? Yeah. Okay. It says having the freedom to govern oneself or control your own affairs. Govern one's self. Okay? Rule oneself. Govern oneself. Decide. Like, decide. Decide. Yeah, I, again, whenever, whenever I hear that, all I think about is my little kids. Again, one of... One of one of the first words after the word no is self. 
myself. I do that. I do that. <laughs> I do that. Self. Remember, we were talking about this the other day. One of Caleb's um, first words was hot. He didn't say the word the H in front of it, though. It's hot, hot. Um, but this idea of self, yeah, myself, autonomous alone. I think it's a great, it's synonymous. So the word in uh, the Hebrew word in Genesis that all the, I mean, just in a brief look at, um, it looked like to me almost all the, these translations use the word alone, but it means to be separate, to, to be separated from, separate from. So it's this idea of being separated. I'll say separated. Of course, I mean, it's, up, it's obvious here. It's separated from what? Again, the creature Adam was with lots of other things, beings, if we want to include dogs as beings. I like the Chronicles of Narnia, so I can, I can think of animals as beings and that we'll talk to them in heaven. That's not in the Bible, but... Um, so there's other beings, other creatures, um, other humans, but ultimately they're separated from whom? And it, I mean, this is a slam dunk in scripture, right? And we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to Ephesians here in just a second to highlight uh, some Ephesians passages. I think it's helpful, especially as Jeff is still in Ephesians, but separated from God. And who took the action? Well, go ahead. So I'm going to... If I can, Jeff, what's the definition of good? Delightful, possible, <clears throat> desirable, useful, pleasing, suitable. So when you say it's not good for man to be alone, we go, okay, then it must be bad. So good, bad, pretty, black and white, binary, right? But good is delightful, pleasing, profitable, suitable, suitable. Profitable is in there. You know? I put it in there. I'm talking. I get to put it in there like dogs okay. in heaven. Okay. 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 Yeah. So that applies to autonomy. As far as what? I interrupted you and I lost my train of thought. That is not good, but good is more than good or bad. Okay. Good is delightful, pleasing, not profitable, Suitable. but it should be useful. <laughs> useful. <laughs> okay. All right, any other thoughts? So separated from. And now there's a whole bunch of, um, let's see, we'll go ahead and go to uh, go to Ephesians 4.18. I guess I have one question. Yeah, David. At, at that point, I get confused where it was, it was like a human interaction. He didn't, there wasn't someone who could understand on that level, I guess. But it's like that was before Paul, wasn't it? And he didn't have a relationship with God. So I completely agree with that. Let's go in let's go in there. Like we we need him all the time. We need him then, but it's like well, I don't I don't understand the the alone back then. It's like he had maybe then he did come. Well the, the passage in Genesis chapter two was just as part of the creation story. He God created Adam and then he said, Hey, it's not good for Adam to be alone. Um so is that what's your question? But he was walking with God every day, I think, at that point. And there was no, there was no sin yet. Oh, it's like, it, I, you touched on it before, Jeff. I forget how you... Yeah, I mean, we've had this ongoing discussion. It doesn't matter if you just realize on one level you have the fact that whether Adam and Eve were in harmony with God before Genesis 3 or whether there was already a separation, in a way, it's like you end up getting there either way. So what he's saying about aloneness, it... In my mind, at least, which helps to me resolve it, is like you got two levels of that aloneness. You got the level of just okay, so one being with another being, um, you know, where he literally didn't have another human companion yet. But that is still it's the lesser and greater. It's like there's the level of the physical and the human, and then there's the greater level of the, of the vertical between man and God. And that level, whether it was already in seed form there or not, that there, there, there would be separation. And so I think, you know, what, what this is driving at is like that the physical level is always pointing to the deeper, more important vertical spiritual level. Yeah, because that, that what I'm trying to say right now is, yeah, it doesn't matter to me what the, or what, the or, what, what happened and when 
It, yeah, as far as the timeline then. It, is God talking about both the practical level of other human or whatever relationships at that point in time? Sure. But what is the deep, what do we absolutely know to be true through the rest of Scripture that all of Scripture is about? Man is separated from God. He's alienated from God. He's, he is, um, he, well, already, he's alone. And, and when, he, when I say alone, he is making himself alone. Man is making himself alone. He's, he's making himself autonomous. He's thinking that's best for him. And therefore, what does God do? I mean, that, that's the big, absolute slam dunk in the rest of Scripture. So to me, yeah, it doesn't matter what, how that... I don't, I don't, I'm not even going to debate about, you know, the, like, the what and the when and the who in, in the beginning parts right there. Yeah, Tracy. I think what helped me this year in putting all that is that Jesus in the Gospels, especially to Nicodemus, he was saying, unless you've been born from above, you cannot see God. Adam was the first creature made of dust who was just natural man. So God, in essence, from that point on, is promising the Spirit himself given to us, as we now know, as a down deposit. So it helps me now to realize it wasn't a decision that was made or not made. Man of dust, without the Spirit to see the kingdom of God, cannot even fathom God and cannot value or see or process God for who he is. We need Jesus' spirit given to us, as Romans 5 says, to now have that he is a good God. So it's not even a, he made the wrong decision. He's, it's just without God's spirit in us, we cannot see him. For who yeah, so if you stop right there, that's the state of every man alive today and who's ever been born. And it's okay? not a moral thing. Yeah, it's so... Yeah, that reminds me, Ronnie and I started the, uh, that little documentary thing about the American gospel, um, which I think, I think was actually pretty good. Ronnie <laughs> didn't, didn't like it that much. But it's mainly because of its, it's what started us on our trek, at least Jeff and I, a long time ago here at this church regarding this idea. Is this about morals and morality? Is this... Um, what is this all about when we're talking about the good news? Because in, in what, what had happened in that documentary is, hey, they said a lot of good things, and they highlighted the, um, the conflict, okay, that, that basically um, I think they were highlighting the fact that, hey, this is about Jesus, not about, not about morals, not about the law. This is about Jesus, and there's a message about Jesus that is unlike anything else in, in any other religion in, in, in the world, okay? However, when you, when, you, when you hear people talk, it's still mixed up with this morality thing. It's like the morals is, are still there. Um, and I, I don't want to debate that this morning. The main point being, what is the main point? The main point is, this is the way people are. This, that, that's a slam dunk through all of Scripture. Did... Whether or not Adam and Eve had a choice, made a choice that, that you know, then turned into, I don't even care. I mean, sorry, it may, it may sound blasphemous to some people. But it's, in a sense, I don't care because this is absolutely the case for me and the rest of humanity. To where, so we see that man and creatures are alone, they're separated. So go to Ephesians chapter 2. It says we're dead, okay? We're, we are morally we're spiritually dead, okay? Completely dead. And, and, and you guys know this. Ephesians is not the only place. It's over and over in Scripture. It, it's over and over in the Old Testament. So we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are dead spiritually. And dead means dead, okay? We can't do anything to save ourselves. So that's the state of man. Of course, last week we were talking about, because we were talking about joy, so the, you know, the result of that, and we can keep on filling in the result of that. The results are, hey, that's pretty sad and depressing. And I don't mean just the fact that we're dead. I mean the reality of us living like this, my craving to be autonomous, which sets me apart 
as being alone, alone away from God, which ironically, I mean, do you see what we humans do to each other? Now, Chop, Chaz, you know, when we were, when we were talking about that, that's a great example of, of kind of from a, from a group perspective, what every individual does. But we, we separate ourselves from God. We're separated from him because we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're spiritually dead. But again, from a practical perspective, what do you do with and to other human beings? Eventually. See, and you say exploit, which, yeah, we've talked a lot about that, but ultimately, it is separating ourselves from other people. It, it is pushing, you know, it is, it is, so that exploitation creates a wall. Of course, you know, we go into Ephesians in chapter 2, where he's talking about peace, talking about tearing down the wall of enmity, the wall of hatred. Being alone, separated from God, ultimately and practically makes us alone from each other and separate from each other, too. I wasn't even planning on going into a whole bunch. Anybody, anybody have any ideas there or thoughts? Do you agree with that? I mean, you say exploit, um, which is absolutely true. I mean, you say exploit. You want to explain the word exploit? We're, we are doing what we believe is good for us right, in our I, autonomy. Even though I can hear you know I should be concerned about someone else's ben their welfare, if push comes to shove, I'm going to take care of myself first. Even though I'll say, no, I shouldn't do that, it is what I do. And yeah, I, and I think we would agree, too, that it's not just when push comes to shove. If you really look at the motives of what you... Well, the mask will come off really quickly. Yeah, when... when, when I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just saying. It's even way before when push comes to shove. Yeah, right. It's even when I'm doing good things for other people. It, there's a benefit to me, too. So, I, yeah, I don't want to go down that tangent, but go ahead, Laura. Well, I was just going to say I've been thinking, you know, autonomous and alone and govern, governing oneself you know, you can look at that definition and go, well, yeah, you know, I can govern myself, I can make my own decisions, but it quickly becomes, okay, if I'm governing myself, <clears throat> there are other people involved, so I need to govern them as well, and then that's where, you know, the exploitation, or I want to rule, rule them too, because this is my little kingdom, and you happen to be on the periphery of it. Yeah, and we've talked about this extensively as far as the, hey, what, 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 are the, what are the results of that? What are the consequences? It's different for every flavor of person in here. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this alone aspect, this separated from aspect. We're separated from God. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And I wanted to, and so that's, that's Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 says, um, they are darkened, at least, of course, he's specifically talking about the Gentiles right here in this immediate context. But he says, they are darkened in their understanding. So that, that kind of highlights even that idea of we, like, we can't see God. So we're dark, they're darkened in their understanding, and they're alienated from the life of God. If you look at that in your translation, guess what another word is? Excluded. Separated from, excluded from. Again, it's really interesting. Because you know, when, I, when I hear, especially the word excluded, that sounds like to me, I can have a victim mindset with that word. I mean, do you know why I say that? Yeah. Why do you think I say that? Well, if you're not included, if you're not part of the you know, pack, you're, you're out. It's somebody else doing that to me. Yeah, yeah. It's no fair. I mean, again, from, a, from this, from, a, from a, an autonomous perspective, Hey, I got a problem with that because you're excluding me from what I think I should be included. But I mean, the reality of Scripture shows what, though, regarding man's heart. Who is doing the excluding in a sense? I am. Any, any other thoughts? Well, I think both truths exist simultaneously. I think we are both. We're all victims and perpetrators. So there's never like. 
There's never an instance in which both aren't true. Yeah, I agree with that, but my point is the, the aloneness, the alienation, the separation is not a result of something or somebody else that does something to me. Even though I would agree that, hey, that happens too from a practical perspective, that yeah, I'm being excluded too. It is an action that can happen, but ultimately the, the heart action is I'm the one that is, has separated myself. Yeah, Ron? Well, the word literally means belonging to another. Which word? Alienated. So if you are being belonging to another, I mean, it's like it's that idea of <laughs> you are belonging to the, the father of this world. I mean, all of that, the verbiage that talks about that reality, the darkness, that we belong to that. Which is, which is interesting, so I'm just going to write, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it in red. So, belonging to another highlights the fact that there's never really aloneness. I'm either belonging to my creator, or I'm belonging to another, which Ephesians says that we are children children of, what does he say, verse two, or chapter 2. Uh, following the prince of the power of this air, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So it's a, it, this, you're always belonging to something. That's interesting, it's interesting that, um, that so the, you're saying the word alienated from means Belonging to another. Well, and all the references that says you are of your father, the devil. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that is a father. I mean, it, it's always showing the contrast between father God and father, father the devil. Okay. Any other thoughts? So they're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the darkness, or due due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given them up to sensuality, greedy practice of every kind of impurity. That's where the morality thing gets mixed up. You know, that's just showing the, 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 the practical or life results as, there was, as the consequences of the inherent state of being, of uh, this, the inherent state of deadness of a human. That's where the good news is, is that Christ, who had complete persuasion of his father being the good father and trustworthy, he has given us his spirit. So that ability now to see God for who he is, is there, even though we can't fully act out on all of that yet, because we're still in this flesh that is still, this world system is still going to do all that. Stuff. Okay, so now, so you just... You jump the gun. No, no. <laughs> but that, but that this is a perfect time to go to it. So now the good news, the gospel. That's the state of human beings. We talk all the time about the practical aspect of this, okay? Which we, which we just did a little bit of last week. The good news is, and I wrote the word Emmanuel. So Matthew, um, Matthew one twenty three. So Emmanuel, Matthew is saying of Jesus, the baby, that he is Emmanuel, using the, the same word that the prophets used before, and Emmanuel meaning what? God with us, which then highlights, or, or what, what, is, what is God doing? What is he, what is he taking action upon? Regarding what we just talked about. Separation. Separation and aloneness. He's dwelling with them in the midst of that, just exactly like Israel coming out of Egypt, and God dwells with them. And in a sense, nothing about their worldly circumstances have changed in that you could even hurt, but, but God is dwelling with them in it. And that's the picture of now what Christ's spirit is dwelling literally in my earthly tent and causing me to 
see God for who he actually is. Yeah, which you brought up the word. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I love that too because like God's God's character has been the same from the very beginning. Like, I mean, with Christ coming, he he's here. But in the Old Testament, you see God coming to be with his people, coming, coming after us to rescue. You see the picture of redemption, and his character is the same as God the Father in the Old Testament and then like Christ here on earth. Yeah, and, and Jeff has gone over it openly. <coughs> repeatedly over the last couple of years and going through Exodus. I love the Old Testament, and it's becoming even more clear over and over again that look at what the people do, and then look at what God does. And, and, and for me, it's very different than the way I experienced this idea of God in church, which I'm not even going to go there. But what I see is the reality is this people, you know, use Exodus, and I love Deuteronomy. It started me on my trek a long time ago. With the, when when I you know I saw at the beginning of Deuteronomy when, when um, Moses is can't go into the promised land and he's he's saying, hey, don't forget what God has done for you. And then he says, you're going to forget what God has done for you. You're going to think you've got this all for yourself. And that's what happens. And what does God do? repeatedly, over and over and over again. It's like there is no, yeah, it's a constant rescue. It's an over and over again rescue. Again, it's, a, it's an otherworldly rescue because I would have given them probably two chances. Maybe three just because that's the American way, right? Or no, it's, it's the third one you go, no, you, you did, didn't do it the first two, so I, I'm not going to get burned again. Again, it's separation. Yeah, Dave. I've been reading God's uh, name, the picture for Israel, their, their harlotry and their rebellion. Um, at one point, he, he uh, tells, you know, Jose to bring his wife back, essentially. And uh, then he starts talking about Israel and uh, he, him, him redeeming Israel. And he says, you shall no longer call me, or you shall call me Ishai, which is uh, husband, and you will, not, you will no longer call me Lord, basically. Like, in other words, I, I'm binding myself to you intimately, and I, I think that's that's that picture of Adam and Eve and the intimacy that they have. And I, I really do think God's painting a picture for us of the intimacy that He's going to create a, 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 in Christ later on uh, for us to bring us near to Him and call us spouse, not you know servant or slave in that sense. Well, and, and the picture there is that's the story of he, he marries the prostitute, right? And the consistent unfaithfulness, the repeated unfaithfulness, and the, and the, um, just the, uh, what, the dirtiness of that from a human perspective, the, from, from a Hebrew perspective, it, that made zero sense, but yet the picture was, this is what you, this is what we can consistently do to God, and yet God has attached himself to us, and he is with us, Jeff. I was going to say, maybe it helps illustrate too why, why you made a distinction, that we made a distinction between like there's just a moralistic framework and a deeper spiritual framework. It's like it wasn't just that it was dirty, like it was, it was that in the sense that deeper it was like a disloyalty, it was like this ongoing disloyalty from the harlot wife, right? And which is was fixed us, right? So, so we're the disloyal. By nature, perpetually disloyal, and God is perpetually loyal, and so that goes a layer deeper than just some moral thing where she did a bad thing and slept with someone else. Like it's it's a disloyalty in the heart. Of yeah, I mean, think of the other words: the betrayal, disloyalty. I mean, just from a practical love perspective, if that happens, and if that happens over and over again, pretty clear you don't you don't desire me, you don't love me, you don't care for me. You're caring for yourself. So yeah, disloyalty, betrayal. Um, and it, again, it highlights, it highlights the human, again, the human aspect. And, and, and it highlights even greater God as far as his action and his activity. I um, just have a couple other passages uh, in looking up that word uh, help. 
Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Again, a different kind of help. And again, a different kind of help isn't just, again, it isn't to help live a different way necessarily. No, it's, what is the necessity? To help see God, to be born anew. I mean, it made me think of the uh, the other verse, John 15, 5, especially in talking about um, man as a creature. Anybody have any, you remember at all what's in John 15, 5? We'll do a little sword drill. It's the vine and the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. The, this idea that, again, God has created us creatures to be, and, and the good news is, to be in relationship with him, that he is our help, and only he alone is our help. Uh, and apart from that help, what, what happens? What, what, is the, what is the result? It's death. It's deadness. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from the vine, what, are the, what happens to the branches? You, you shrivel up and die. So just, just, again, that practical perspective or the practical picture of, of real life and that plant and the, and the vine. So, yeah, John 15, 5, I am the vine. Um, you are the branches. Uh, John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life. Of course, again, what, 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 what is the way you have heard that or that you think you've experienced that in normal church land? Especially with what he says after yeah, it's, it's again, it's it's this superficial, and again, I, I'm not trying to blame anybody or anything, it's just the way we're wired, okay, so we hear things a certain way, but it's this superficial idea that, oh wow, God is, you know, Jesus has come to, yeah, make my life better, make it good, make it comfortable, whereas, no, we're talking about life and death, we're talking about, I'm spiritually dead, and he's come to give me life. You know, the dead bones picture of, um, of the Old Testament is these dead bones are laying all over the, the, the desert floor or the wilderness floor, and it's dead. They can't do anything. And what, is, what happens in the vision? Brings them to life. He brings dead bones to life. So Jesus saying, I have come that you may have life. And the idea of more abundant is, is way more than anything we could ever picture that to even be. Did who? Tracy, did you, yeah. Well, another cool thing that we saw in Romans is the, the common word in death, dying, dead, die, I guess all of that, but is separation. So it, it's the focus on separation. So you could even go back, Greg had his, what did you call it, your paraphrase? We can say God is saying it's not good for man to be dead. <laughs> it's not good for man to be without life. And he's like, I will make him a helper suitable for that. I will give him life. And that's what he promises. Yeah, he promises. And again, the good news is, he promises, he says, I mean, this is, again, the picture in all the Old Testament. Old Testament is rescue. God is with them. He's always with them, even when they don't think that he's there. He, he's constantly saying, I'm here, I'm rescuing. And he's also pointing forward saying, I'm bringing a rescuer. I'm going to give you my helper. I'm going to give you life. I just lost my train of thought. But the good... I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Go ahead, Ronnie. Well, what, I, what I think is really cool is that when it, he's promising this good news, and the same with in Ephesians, he's also promising, well, with this good news comes peace. And that word peace literally has the idea of to join <clears throat> together, <laughs> to be whole again. So it, it adds to that idea of our separation, and now we are joined together. He has created peace in Christ. We are now back with God literally living in us, his spirit. Yeah, so I, that's where I was going. Because So I absolutely agree with what you said regarding death, but what helps me from a practical perspective as far as what is the issue and what is God, what is God saying is this idea of separation. Is that we're separated from God. 
And God says, and then like you just said, he, he's, he's joining us together to him and with him through Christ, because of Christ. So Christ comes and he says, I'm joining you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing us together again. I'm, I am bringing you out. And that's the idea in, in Ephesians too. You who are far off, I'm bringing near again. And I'm joining you together. I'm getting rid of the wall of enmity. And, and just even, you know, Paul gives that idea of filling up again. Filling up to the full. That idea that, we're, that you're empty and, and God is filling. He's joining. He's joining us together. He's filling. He, he is the one that's doing all of this. And it's God with us. Any other thoughts? The word that keeps bouncing around in my head is that he's reconciled us to himself. So when I used to hear the gospel, the word the gospel, I thought evangelism in heaven. Okay? Or, but actually God says, it, it's more than you going to heaven. I've reconciled all of that and brought you to me. Which is bigger than I get to go to heaven. I get to have a relationship with God who initiates it and takes care of it, crosses all that out, blocks it out. So that's what runs through my mind. You guys have any other, what, what words come to mind when you hear the word reconcile? Marriage. Marriage? That's, that's a more, there's so much more closeness when you hear like that. It's less, you know, it's less, it's like all barriers are removed. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, even as you say that, I, oh, I think it must have been in the American Gospel thing. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, what each of you, what each of your flavors are, what your blocks are, or what helps you. Um, and, I, and again, this is not a contradiction. I completely agree with you, Dave. Um, but when I think about God and, and marriage, it's really hard for me. I mean, I understand the concept, but even when I, you know, even using uh, our marriage, you know, the physical marriage here on earth between two humans that are battling this right here, um, and, and I, I love our marriage. I love being married. Uh, I, I don't. I wouldn't want that in any other way. But yet, it's so flawed. And it's such a stumbling, bumbling thing that, you know, when Scripture talks about, you know, God as, as not just our father, but, you know, our husband, and this picture of marriage, that's, that's hard for me to, that's a hard, I mean, I understand it theological or, you know, theologically or philosophically, but um, it's a weird thing. And that's kind of cool. Even thinking What's about cool? my relationship with God right now, it is. I mean, it's flawed in that I can't yet, until I'm going to be in his presence, until we're in his presence, my sin, as Romans 7 said, the law of sin is still dwelling. So it, it's flawed in, in that sense. You get what I mean? It's like oh, yeah. Picture. No, and, and but I can see the Of course, heaven is taking on a completely different picture for me now in the relational sense. That, yeah, I can, I can understand that concept that he's talking about a different kind of marriage. He's talking about a different kind of union. A, a union, a marriage, a relationship in which there is no separation anymore. There's not this weird, crazy, con I mean, just even in Ronnie talking to me this morning, the, the things I'm observing about what's going on in my own head, we're not even having an argument. She's just talking about stuff that she's excited about. And, and I'm, I'm realizing, of course, I'm driving, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. I can't you know, completely focus on her. I've got other thoughts going on, and, and they're in conflict with, you know, what she's trying to tell me. I'm recognizing that, hey, wow, I, I, it'd be it'd be good to say something right here, and I don't say something. And but it's just this this human experience is just a crazy, weird experience that's full of this stuff right here. And so, yeah, I see that when God says, hey, you know what? I'm going to make all of that go away. I'm going to reconcile you to myself. I'm not going to hold this against you. 
and I'm going to come rescue you. I'm going to give you new life. I'm going to give you life. Because that's the other thing, too. You know, we don't, I don't see myself as dead. I understand that philosophically. I understand that um, theologically. I believe that. But look, I'm not dead. I'm making decisions all the time. I thought you were raising your hand. Um, I was just thinking of the word healing, like the word reconciling. Like, you know, just as a healer, I think that's what it means. Like, Like that word hide, because that's the aloneness, the autonomy, the separation. Yeah, one of my favorite words in Chinese was reconcile, because when you translate it to English, it was ha ha. Ha is together, and how is good. So I would always, because if you try to explain the word reconcile, it's kind of a difficult English word. But if you think together, good, especially in light of yeah. that and grace. Definition of no, that's great. It's, it's amazing when you... Together good is a really basic, perfect explanation of reconciling. I love that word. That's See, what I can remember. Yeah, for any of you... If you, if you don't, don't what? Chinese stuff. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it's how I think. It's talked about it. <laughs> if you thought that way... If you've never studied languages before, it, it's fascinating. And if you've ever wondered why it can be so difficult as far as different translations in the Bible, it's because in, in any language, most words don't have a direct word-by-word -word translation. They have an explanation or they have a picture or something like that. So that's a great example. Together, good. Yeah, Ronnie. I'm paying attention to you right now. <laughs> It means to cause to coexist, to exist. This is reconcile? In harmony, yes. And then the word harmony now I <laughs> so it makes me even think to live, you know, to exist is living in harmony. And the word harmony means the quality of forming a pleasing and consistent whole. So even that idea, same with peace, harmony, it has the idea of bringing into a consistent, pleasing whole. God with us. But isn't that interesting? Just in light of what we just said, you know, about this right here, separated, alone, hiding, fear, belonging to another, and then the good news is this idea of reconciliation, together good, we'll say. And that's, that's why we needed help. We needed a helper. We needed Christ. It's only in Christ is any of this possible. Like Hebrews, he, he was made like us so that he could empathize with our weaknesses, meaning somebody's already said it, but that he understands, I think Grace was saying, all the cracks in us, all the frailty. I mean, we're just but dust. So as dust, we can't grasp the gem of who our God is. And so it, it to me, because my, my, um, Journey has been why I've grown up as a Christian. Why do we need Jesus? Why did he have to die on the cross? I, I mean, even when I think I was a bad person, he's going to forgive me, but it didn't make sense. This is now making 
sense. Yeah, you guys get that from the practical level? That's why I'm kind of pounding this. This makes sense. Jesus makes sense. It's just not some magical, theological, religious thing. It's because this is the way we are. Everybody is. So man creatures need help. God gives help. And the help is this. I have to be reconciled. If I stay by myself, I will stay by myself alone. Divided, separated, alone. And God says, hey, I'm going to reconcile you. I'm going to, I'm going to make you guys coexist in harmony, forming a complete, consistent whole. Again, just giving the example of regular human marriage. It's not a consistent whole. It's inconsistent. Together, good. All right, we've got to stop. Any other thoughts? All right. When you guys hear yourself say Jesus to somebody, or the gospel, or anything with a religious tint to it, I, I want to challenge you to try to go, wait, a minute, what, what am I what do I think about that? Or what am I what am I saying? What does that mean from, from a real life practical level? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I, I thank you that um, that you are real, that you are the only God who, as Scripture says, you, you created the heavens and the earth, and that you are our help, and not just one who is standing in the distance offering help, waiting for us to accept your help. You have said over and over again, you are giving us your help. You are dwelling among us. You are giving us your spirit. You are giving us your new life. And that one day, ultimately, um, we will see you like we see each other. We'll see you face to face. And all of this um, aloneness and separation will be gone. And we'll be living in a life that is uh, unlike anything that we can even begin to, begin to fathom right now. We thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name I pray.